drive one to the two, two to the three, and the place to be. BQ with the King of the Mountain podcast. Thanks for joining us again this week as we talk Global Force Wrestling Impact. Please subscribe to my channel here on the tube of you. Not only do I upload the podcast here on the channel, but I do other types of digital content like breaking news and vlogs and getting ready to start my interview series called Talking Armageddon. We'll be interviewing Sienna this coming Monday. Do me a favor as well. Please give a thumbs up and leave a comment if you're listening on YouTube. That engagement helps me quite a bit and helps the podcast spread around on YouTube. If you're listening to us on another platform, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, please hit that subscribe button as well. And it'd be greatly appreciated. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, I would love a five-star review from you. And that really helps the podcast get out there too. Because let's face it, there's some podcasts out there on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and they, they freaking stink. And the five-star rating will help me quite a bit to start catapulting ahead of those guys. But I'm in a real good mood this week. We just hit 600 subscribers here on YouTube. And for four weeks in a row, the listenership of the podcast has grown and grown and grown. And I think the coolest part was in the first 40 hours of last week's upload, it surpassed the total plays of the previous week's episode. So the station is growing real quick, growing real fast. The podcast is growing. And if you checked out my tweet on Twitter, um, I finally got back into the military, into the uh, Air Force Reserves. I had done almost 15 years active duty and Obama decided to cut the military one day and I kind of lost my career. And it's taken me about two and a half years to get back in because once you get out, it's very, very, very difficult to get back in. There's, there's a good chance a lot of you have dealt with some kind of recruiter in your life when you were maybe 18 or so and they hound you and do anything to get you in. It is not like that when you get out. It's a big uphill struggle. And as I said, it took me two and a half years to do it. And yesterday I finally swore in, enlisted, and I am back in the game. So needless to say, I'm in a good mood. The podcast is doing well and personal life is going well. Got a new job that I started in three months that I'm very excited about, federal job. So things are going good on my end. Shout out to all our other podcasting colleagues out there. I just started the uh, podcast spotlight on the channel, just highlighted the heel cast this last week. So if you haven't checked that out, go click on it. And in the comments, you can subscribe to their channel. They do a really good job covering impact. They've been doing it longer than I have. So definitely check them out. Also, if you're looking for a great home on Facebook, there is the impact fan zone. It's a very uh, entertaining fan page. Lots of uh, engaging topics on there. It's, it's a really good page to be a part of. So you just got to go to facebook.com slash impact wrestling FZ for fan zone. I'm now an admin on that page, but uh, there's some other great admins on there. It is a great site to check out and to be a part of. So definitely if you're on Facebook, go to the impact fan zone. Today's guest host. I've been excited about this because he's a tremendous podcaster. I really enjoy hearing him and, uh, Shit, without further ado, we got Ryan, a.k.a. Mr. Showtime. How you doing today, my man? Hey, man, I'm doing pretty good. Um, it's, uh, it's a beautiful Saturday afternoon and, uh, you know, about to talk some wrestling, right? Can't go wrong with that. I got to talk to you about something else first. You're in, you're in Ohio, right? I am. Yeah, I'm in a, I'm a Cleveland, Ohio. I'm a, I'm a suffering uh, Cleveland sports fan. So that's, that's exactly <laughs> that's exactly what I wanted to talk to you about. So. Just to get off the topic of wrestling here for a couple seconds, what are you thinking about this whole Kyrie Irving thing? Um, it's, it, it's, I don't know. It kind of came out of left field, and there, there's a point where, you know, the Cavs really weren't doing too much, like too many big moves in the postseason. There was a lot of, a lot of just weird shifts with like, you know, general managers and whatnot, and and a lot of potential trades that kind of fell through. So. And there's a part of me that's almost like I, I don't blame him, but you know I just I don't know why, you know why him out all of a sudden. So, kind of sucks. But um, I mean he's not traded yet, so we'll see what happens. I know a lot of people are kind of pissed about it though. Yeah, it seems like uh, Cleveland's been building a older team, you know, like a team meant for a different era in the NBA, 
And it seems like even though LeBron, I don't think LeBron's going anywhere personally, but if he happens to, he's not willing to take over that team because he feels like the pieces don't fit his game. Yeah, I mean, and and I don't know. I mean, I think I think right now it's he's he's still got time left here, and I think that you know, yeah, we we you know we went to the finals last year, and we you know we didn't get the job done, but I mean, think about it. I mean, Cleveland sports in general for any Cleveland team to go to the finals or the championship three years in a row, regardless whether you win it or not, that's kind of unheard of, you know? So I don't know. Maybe I'm looking at the glass half full, but I think that there's a lot for uh, LeBron James to kind of work with. Uh, you know, we got we got Derrick Rose coming over. We kind of got him with the first steal. Uh, hopefully he stays healthy, but uh, hopefully that'll maybe entice some other uh, bigger names and, and bigger talents to uh, to come to Cleveland. Yeah, it's a big if with uh, D. Rose staying healthy, but I do feel you. I'm a lifelong L.A. Clippers fan, and we haven't even come close to the NBA Finals, so uh, at least you guys have had some more success than we have. Um, talk to us. I know you're taking a little bit of a break, but talk to us about your podcast and where we can find it. Yeah, so um, I, I actually I have two podcasts. Uh, flagship podcast, I guess you can call it flagship. It's just the one I've been doing the longest. Uh, it's called Rebellion Wrestling Radio. Um we do a lot of stuff, you know. We we like to cover whatever news is is going on. I have a lot, you know, different co-hosts that I kind of uh, uh, kind of rotate in and out. We got Hammer, we got Michelle, we got Chase, uh, my buddy Joe Joe Dub that comes on there. Um, you know, we'll we'll talk about the news, but sometimes we like to do little flashbacks and talk about, you know, fantasy bookings and stuff like that. So that's that's Rebellion Wrestling. We'll do some interviews when we when we uh, go to the indie shows and whatnot. Um, and then I just recently started, I want to say a month or two ago, possibly, uh, Impact Aftershock. And I, the thing is, is that out of all my friends, I'm probably like the biggest TNA, Impact, GFW fan, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I've been watching it since uh, since they had the NWA TNA, like the $9 pay-per-views, like back in the day that you would order on a Wednesday. So I, I felt that, that uh, Impact wasn't getting enough love. And I wanted to uh, do something separate just for Impact Wrestling, and uh, that's that's where we are now. Um, haven't done an episode in about uh, probably the last three or four weeks, and that's just strictly due to um, adulting, you know, <laughs> just uh, yeah, I've been a lot there. of yeah. I know adulting's terrible; it's the worst. Um, but yeah, I'm getting back into it. Um, just did an episode of Rebellion last night, um, and we're I, I literally because um, I've been so freaking swamp of work uh i just started uh catching up on this week's episode of impact this morning so i'm kind of just wrapping it up right now but um kind of did you know saw the like the clips on, on youtube so playing catch up but things should be back to normal in about about a week or so okay good deal um so where can we find the podcast at oh yeah i guess i guess that would be important right <laughs> um so both of them are going to be on the, the main website it's rebellionwrestling.com so you can go to RebellionWrestling.com. Uh, there's a section. It's right on the front page. You'll, you'll see the latest episode of, of each uh, Rebellion Wrestling and Impact Aftershock. And then we also have uh, pages for the archives as well. Um, we're on uh, – we, so when we stream live on Spreaker.com, so it's, it's going to go – um, from Spreaker, it also streams live on YouTube at the same time. Um, if you're an Apple user, you can go to iTunes, um, Android, pretty much any – podcast app you just type in either impact aftershock or rebellion wrestling um we're there so so last night we had the live event the first live event in a year and a half if you guys are listening here to the channel i will be having a separate upload with kyle who used to be part of the podcast he was there at the show and there's been a lot of conflicting crap going out with dirt sheets and everything about how many people were there, how many people weren't there, what the atmosphere was like. So Kyle's going to be come on, coming on as someone who was there, and we're going to talk the first night. And I'm going to be doing a separate show as well with uh, another individual who I, I met on Twitter <laughs> that uh, was is going to be there tonight. So right now, as we speak to you, it's Saturday morning. So the other show's tonight at the ballpark, and I'll be having two separate shows covering the Impact Live. So... We get it from the horse's mouth, not the dirt sheets. None of that nonsense. So let us talk Impact Wrestling this week. The last few weeks I've been a huge fan of the show. And 
I won't say I didn't like this one. I didn't like it as much as some of the previous ones. Um, I don't I don't know exactly know why it wasn't there wasn't anything I hated necessarily. I guess I just wasn't as entertained as I was the previous weeks. But I do want to put this out there, and I got into some arguments on Twitter with people because I don't. If you know me, I I I don't want to say rarely. I never shit on the Impact Zone fans. I've always stood up for them. But I finally said something on Twitter the other night because in this episode you can see quite a few people dead center in the front row. Um, I can't even say sitting on their hands because they're not sitting, but they're stone stone faced, not making a single reaction, and the body language is absolutely terrible. And I called it out on Twitter. Of course, it got to some of these people, and even to some people who weren't who were just in the front row in general. And you know, a couple people cursed me out, which is which is fine. It's whatever. I said something that they didn't like, and that's that's good. You know, we are gonna express opinions back and forth. But I will put the disclaimer out there. There was a, this was during the storm in Orlando and someone in the front row had told me that they wait. I don't know if this is an exaggeration or, or what. I'm just going to go ahead and believe them that they waited outside for an hour and a half before they were let in. Now I remember reading a report that Dutch was yelling at Universal, open the doors, open the doors. Let's get these guys in. The weather was so bad, but apparently it was Universal's call due to the due to the weather to not let these people in yet so how does it how does it make sense <laughs> i don't know i don't know if they were concerned with um maybe flooding or you know, you know what i'm saying something that had nothing to do with the people but maybe there was some other issue that they said hey we got to handle this first or who knows but i'm just reporting what i was told that they waited outside for quite some time and by the time they got in they were pretty pissed off and not really in the in the best mood and i did read this i don't, I don't want to say it was on a dirt sheet i just know i read it somewhere on some kind of wrestling publication that there was um there was a storm and it that it did affect the crowd so hmm. so interesting you know um i don't think that i, I don't want to piss anyone else off in the impact zone i don't think it's necessarily always an excuse because the body language from week to week is pretty bad with a lot of people but uh, if you listen to how there's an there's a segment where Dutch Mantel is not Dutch, but it was uh, Bruce, my, my favorite person, Bruce. He was yelling at Sanjay when and we'll talk about Sanjay a little bit later. But when Sanjay came down and Bruce was yelling at him, the camera was right in Bruce's face and you could not understand a single word that Bruce was saying. It was almost completely muted so i hope people look at situations like that and realize how compressed that audio is in inside the impact zone because that camera was right next to his face and you couldn't understand a single word he was saying so before we start jumping on the impact zone you, you got to look at things like that you gotta you gotta have an ear for things like that um but the audio is definitely compressed in there i wish it was i, w I don't know I, I wish it was something they would uh focus on and uh be a lot, much better experience for us at home but let's talk the opening matchup it is the uh, super x cup tournament match and we got desmond xavier versus drago i know you said that you were playing a little bit of catch up mm -hmm. but how was your did you kind of uh i don't want to say did an ncaa bracket type thing but did you, were any of your predictions off with this because in the first round i only got one match right and then I got this one right. So two out of five. Yeah, well, I mean, I kind of looked at it like this. I mean, with what they're doing with the Super X Cup, we're bringing in a lot of indie guys, bringing in guys from from other promotions like AAA. And uh, I, I, I actually know um, Desmond Xavier from doing some indie shows up here in Cleveland. I believe he's from Dayton, Ohio, I believe. So I've had the opportunity to see him a bunch of times. And that was kind of a, a real, uh, real nice uh, surprise. Um, I didn't think that he would be going this far. This far, though, I, I could see them putting Drago, you know, further down um, in the in the uh, the bracket just because of that name recognition. If you kind of look at like Lucha Underground, um, maybe them, you know, trying to capitalize off that. Um, but yeah, no, I, I I didn't see Desmond going this this far, but I, I'm you know pleasantly surprised. I thought the match was like super. Super good, you know, real fast pace, which is what you want from the X Division. Actually, 
invited Desmond to come on the show because I guess he's an Air Force veteran like myself, and he, and he did the same job on active duty that I did. But um, I tried contacting him through email and Twitter, and he declined. I don't even want to say he declined. He didn't respond to either one. So I was really hoping him to, to get him on here and talk about uh, the military and the X Division and all that good stuff. But it doesn't look like that's going to happen. But this match got a lot of time. This match got 15 minutes. It was a great opener. And Desmond Xavier is a blue chipper. He absolutely is. This is someone that I really hope that they put some effort into. And don't just you know throw him to the side kind of as they've done Andrew Everett this entire time. I hope he really gets you know really gets a run here. Yeah, and then that was going to ask your opinion about that. So, um, you know they're bringing in a lot of these these excellent um, uh, you know I guess I can call them indie stars and then stars from other other. Uh, other promotions once the x cup tournament is done do you see them remaining on the roster or do you see like maybe them kind of picking you know a few guys here and there um I, I don't view the x cup like i would the uh x division one night only that they do where it's it's you know it's kind of like the knockouts knockdown where they have you know the x division hopefuls and keep a couple i don't think they're looking at it like that i know that Drago obviously will not be around long term. My, if I had to go with my gut feeling regarding ACH and Sammy Guevara, I think that they are in the long term plans. I just think right now they're being. No one knows for sure if these guys are signed or not. My yeah. gut, t- my gut tells me that they are. I just know that Jeff Jarrett wanted to put a focus, start putting a focus on where wrestlers came from, and what their home base is. So they've been, you know, shouting, shouting out. Wrestle, Cir- Wrestle Circus on the show, which mm-hmm. Wrestle Circus has been retweeting Impact stuff, and they have expressed their gratitude for the shout out on TV because they said they didn't have to do that. And I think that's part of Jeff Jarrett trying to build connections and partnerships. He, I think he's doing it with the smaller indie companies too. So they shouted ACH out as coming from AAW, and they even said from Ring of Honor, they with uh, Drago they name dropped Lucha Underground and then they, uh, they name dropped New Japan too for ACH as well so I know that Jeff is trying to do something different he's he's trying to be the anti Vince McMahon who's going to act like these guys just appeared out of the blue he wants to acknowledge where they came from but I think I think that's the route he's going where he's putting a lot of focus on hey these, this is the indie company that they call a home base to give some exposure to that company and to get some love from that company in return. And then a couple of weeks down the line, they'll address, okay, now this person's a part of the roster. I don't think they just want to say, okay, everyone's a part of the roster because it takes away some of the mystique because they're trying to say, Hey, these, this guy comes from here. This guy comes from there. And if it was just everyone being on the impact roster per se, it wouldn't, it wouldn't come across as special. Yeah, I, I totally get that. And that's, you know, kind of like, on a side note, but still on the same subject, um, since Jeff has kind of taken back over, little things that that kind of stand out to me is when you bring in the guys from the other promotions, and you specifically bring in the champions from the other promotions. The fact that they're letting him come now, like with with the actual title belts from the other promotions, you know, we think about it like five or six years ago. That's absolutely unheard of, and I just think that's real cool. And that, to your point, it makes it makes it seem special makes a uh, gfw look you know it's not like uh you know you look at the wwe you look at lucha underground and you look at something like this that's kind of trying to branch out to everyone and bring the focus back on the wrestlers themselves i think that's actually really cool it's been a famous thing said in the wwe world especially by roman reigns uh, Bret hart has said it said it doesn't matter what you did anywhere else it only matters what you do here and i think taking this this route of recognizing excellence because i think it sets a bad example to america or to the youth or just just people in general when you're saying your achievements at the highest level are the only thing that make you a success um we we talked about basketball earlier Reggie Miller, Reggie Miller never won a ring. Charles Barkley never won a ring. Patrick Ewing, Carl Malone, John Stockton, these guys never won rings. 
Are there failures? I don't think so. I mean, I mean, I look at it like this. Those guys are legends, you know? Right, exactly. And um, I think to to look at it and say, hey, if you didn't accomplish this title and this promotion, that doesn't mean shit. I think that's very unfair. I think any time that you, you recognize excellence, that's why I say, you know, the Impact Hall of Fame... It is important. It is prestigious because it is a wrestling company recognizing excellence. It doesn't matter if you work at Staples or if you work at McDonald's and you win Employee of the Week, Employee of the Month. It's it's a good thing to be recognized when when you've exceeded expectations and when you when you're a standout. That that's a good thing. We we I don't think we should teach people that you you can only exceed at the highest level and you're a failure if if you, if you didn't reach the top of the mountain there. Yeah, and I, you would think that, like, as a promoter, right? And if you sign, you know, the you know former champion of you know New Japan, right? And you you're gonna want to be like, hey, you know what? This guy had, was so successful over here. This guy's one of the best wrestlers in the world, and now his home is GFW. Like, would it, why would you not want to talk about the past accomplishments? I mean, I can tell that's what Jeff is doing. If you, if you, if any company, it doesn't matter how big or small, says, hey, we're putting this belt on you, that is important. That's a milestone. That's something special. So I like that they're highlighting this. But back to the match itself, this was great. And I, I fully expected Desmond Xavier to win this because I said, there's no way. In the next round, how we have Ishimori versus ACH. I think Ishimori, Ishimori is going to win. There's no way they were going to do Drago versus Ishimori in the finals. Two guys that aren't part of the company. There's no mm-hmm. way. <laughs> yeah. So I think, you know, we definitely knew Desmond Xavier was going to win this one. Drago did that running. I don't even know what you want to call it. I would imagine it's his finish. It's like the uh, kind of a running DDT that he kind of flips. He beat Sammy Guevara with it. Oh, the uh, is that they had that hangman's DDT? I don't know if it's a hangman's because that's... Oh, that's something different. Yeah, I think that's if their feet are on the ropes. So I don't know what he calls this exactly. I've always got people on YouTube here that know everything, so I'm sure someone will say what it's called in the comments here. But he used the same move to beat Sammy Guevara, but when he beat Sammy, it was very anticlimactic. Um, Mm -hmm. This time around, he dropped Desmond Xavier with that, and it it was beautiful. And Desmond really sold it well, too. I actually thought the match was over there. But as we said, we got a real blue chipper on our hands here. And we just we don't want him to drop the ball kind of like they're doing with Andrew Everett. Oh, yeah. No, I, I totally get that. I, I want to see I, I want to see him get incorporated into the exhibition storyline, like the exhibition title storyline. Yeah, and it seems like they're doing a better job now of storylines within the X-Division. I just don't want him to, to do, okay, you're part of a storyline. And once you're a storyline that takes you out of the X division, because you know, now we see low key and we're going to talk about him a little bit later was involved in storylines. And now he's, he's been extracted, but um, uh-huh. we'll talk about him a little bit later. The next match we have speaking of the X division is Trevor Lee versus the Mumbai cat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that this was Sanjay right off the bat? Um, I had a feeling when they announced the name and then you could tell by like the ring movements that, Oh yeah, that's definitely Sanjay. And then, you know, putting together the storyline, but it's, it's, it's definitely fun. Uh, I love the, uh, the costume. It's kind of like the, uh, India version of suicide. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty, it, it was, it was, it was fun. I'll, I'll say that. As you alluded to, you could tell by his, his movements that it was him immediately. And I don't know if you remember, about a year and a half ago, there was a segment where Maria had an open challenge type of thing. And like Allie was supposed to give her uh, opponents from the Indies. Mm-hmm. And there was one that came out that was like a ninja and she was throwing all these chops and stuff. And it turned out to be Gail Kim, but it didn't look like Gail Kim's movements. Like she went out there and she was, she was very animated and throwing ridiculous chops and kicks and it didn't look like Gail Kim. So once she unmasks, it's like, oh my God, it's Gail Kim. And even to use a old WWE reference here, or example, I mean, because um, I remember this when I was younger, there was a segment where like the Miz was fired and then he came back with a mask on and, and short trunks instead of the long ones he was wearing. Mm-hmm. 
and he had to win his contract. It was like him versus Eugene contract on a pole match, and he ended up winning and took the mask off. And I remember thinking back then, I didn't know it was him because he, his, his movements and everything were so different. Yeah, yeah, he had that, and then definitely the the attire was. You're so used to at that point seeing the dude in like what, like cargo shorts, like weird, weird long shorts, and yeah, 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 yeah. With with this one, so Sanjay, he has a very unique way of moving and walking, and it was it was extremely obvious. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, I knew that this wasn't a Mumbai cat, and um, especially some of the offense in the ring. Yeah, no, I mean, but I mean, I look at it like this. I mean, it's. We 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 both knew that the you know this this whole storyline between uh, between uh, Trevor Lee and uh, and Sanjay I mean it's not over, and this is just going to be another cog in the machine to kind of keep that going. So I mean, some people may be like, oh, well, you know, we would, knew it was Sanjay, but I mean, I I to that I say, hey, it's wrestling, you know, let's just enjoy it and have fun, you know, and see where it goes. I think Trevor Lee's the one keeping this storyline going because Sanjay's a little bit bland. Um, when they were showing back when he was feuding with low key Mm -hmm. and they were showing Sanjay from like years ago in the early days of the X division. And he had, he had hair. He looked like a straight jabroni. Like he was just, (laughs) just, he looked like one of those Indian jobbers that came out and wrestled Josh Matthews or something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so him having the shaved head really actually gives him some kind of look, some kind of character, but the crowd doesn't really react to Sanjay. And when he unmasked himself, it was just like, okay, there's Sanjay. So Trevor Lee's kind of keeping the story line going, but what do you, where do you think it is going? Because you've got Sanjay, who's not even allowed to be in the arena. And then you got Trevor Lee who stole the title and he's wearing the title and wrestling with it on. Yeah. I, I honestly, what I'm thinking is, you know, not too long ago. And I and correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if, Sanjay still is a backstage producer, but he was doing that for a while. And I think that where this is going is it obviously obviously it's going to lead to the match, the ladder match at uh, Destination. Des- can't even talk Destination X. Um, but I think that it's going to lead to Trevor Lee re- uh, retaining and possibly a way to write Sanjay off a of TV. Like I, I feel like this is his last run. Uh, no, no disrespect to Sanjay. I, I enjoyed him. Really enjoyed his uh, work with uh, Jay Lethal from about ten years ago, actually. Um, but I think that you need that heel champion, and this will be a way for uh, Trevor Lee to keep the title slash, aka, win the title, be the official champion. And I think this is a way to to kind of um, boost whoever's going to be winning the Super X Cup into a feud with Trevor Lee. But do you really want to see Trevor Lee? With another title run because he's had a couple, and I feel like they've been very underwhelming. I personally don't, but I think if if you like, kind of like what you say that he's been the one carrying this feud. So if he can be a little more over the top that he is, if that's even possible, as over top heel, um, we we want to, you know, hate him as the champion. So, you know, and let's say you know I'm just kind of fantasy booking. Let's say Desmond Xavier wins the Super X Cup, right? Everybody's going to be behind Desmond Xavier. He's the new uh, blue chip talent. He's freaking awesome as far as his offense and his moves go. And we want to see somebody knock off Trevor Lee. And I think who else better than than this hot, you know, hot up-and-coming star? So here's another wrinkle in this. Um, but to go back with that, first of all, with Sanjay, for me, I feel like he's going to win a ladder match because I can't imagine this guy finally winning his – first X division title and him not even getting to carry it on any of the shows. <laughs> I just feel like <laughs> I didn't think of it that way, but yeah, I could, I can see that too. But just to throw another wrinkle in this, we've got the match at destination X, which is Matt Seidel and Lashley. Now it's Matt true. Seidel a couple weeks ago appeared to request a title shot. He never said he wanted an X division title shot. It was just implied. Mm-hmm. So, that's another wrinkle in this. Is is Matt Seidel, if he gets the victory over Lashley somehow, is he going to factor himself into the world title picture or this X Division title picture? Yeah, and I think uh, uh, GFW they're they're doing a good job of kind of alluding to the X Division, but on the same, you know, the flip side of that coin, you know, not, you know, they're making it obvious that that we can see him in other 
you know, other championship matches. So I, I do enjoy that. I, I would like that. I, that would be great on to see uh, Matt Seidel get get a shot at the X Division title. I just have this feeling he's going to pull out that victor somehow. And they were talking about this on on the heel cast. My buddy Raven was uh, pointing this out. It was very painful last week to watch when Matt Seidel did the shooting star press on Lashley to a complete dead house. There was no reaction to it or anything, and it was pretty embarrassing to watch from home, in my opinion. Um, I just have this feeling Matt Seidel is going to pull this out because I can't imagine putting Lashley right back in the title picture. He's been in this title picture for ever now. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd like to see him feud with, with somebody else. I'm not sure. I mean, well, let me ask you this. If, if they, let's say Seidel um, gets the win, where do you want to see Lashley go from there? I think we're going to see Lashley take a break because even though it was reported that whatever whatever Team America, fuck yeah, whatever they're called, wants him to... <laughs> America Top Team, is that what okay, it is? Okay, America Top Team wants him to... <laughs> I like your version better, though. Yeah. <laughs> even though they want him to focus on MMA, you know, that was a report that came out a, a few weeks ago. And now I'm, now I'm thinking, okay, this is kind of storyline-ish because it's making its way onto the show where they say, oh, well, we want him to fight full-time. I think it's. I think it has to do with the with the story. I mean, it has to do with a story, and I think I think he's going to take some time off for a little bit. I really do. I just can't. There's there's no money in Lashley versus El Patron again. None. No. There's no. there's not one not one person will tune in for that. I mean, not one extra person. Like, oh, here we go, Lashley versus El Patron four. I mean, we've seen this match three times already. It doesn't feel like it, but. We got it in El Patron's first night in the company. I was there for that. We got it at Bound for Glory, and then we got it the night after. So there's no money in that. That's why I really don't see Lashley moving forward in this. I, I think I see him taking some time off and then maybe coming back to the title picture later. But I really think at this Destination X, we're going to get some really screwy stuff because there's a lot of moving parts with different angles that could easily intertwine with each other. Yeah, no, so. I see that. Yeah, and you know what? You think about it. If, if Lashley does take some time off, go back to MMA, um, I could see Jeff still reporting on that. So we don't forget about Lashley, and you know, hopefully he does well uh, in his fights when he's gone. So when he does eventually make that comeback, he's, he's even more of a monster than he was when he left. You know what I mean? You know, that's why Brock Lesnar kind of works, because he doesn't because he doesn't work he he takes that time <laughs> off and he steps away a little bit and he's never he's never been overexposed and i don't think they overexposed lashley but we're getting there if, if we get another match with him and el patron it's it's going to do a lot of damage to him as an on-screen character i think so there's gonna be some curveballs that come at us i really think so this destination x show is going to be be really huge we get the grand impact championship match with uh Moose defending against EC3. Did you think EC3 had a chance of winning this thing? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, here's the thing. Um, I don't know. This is just me. EC3 is my boy. I love EC3. So, uh, as much as I like Moose, um, I think that EC3 had had a you know a good amount of uh, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Momentum. You know, especially coming off of. Uh, Slammiversary, and then moving into this feud. Uh, Moose has had the title for a while, so I think that, you know, sometimes, you know, title change is good. I didn't see it happening how it did, though. Bruce is really confusing right now as an on-screen character. Oh, my God, yeah. I think we, we got to talk about that. <laughs> I don't know I don't know if it's bad writing. or incon Let me not say bad. We're not experts. Um, I don't know if it's inconsistent writing or if they're trying to confuse us. But it seems like the heels don't like him. The baby faces don't like him. The people at home don't like him. Well, let me ask you this: Why? And and I, I'm this is just still on the subject of Bruce. And then this is actually going to segue back to the Grand Championship. But are we we see these these segments with? I, I enjoy Dutch, um, but we see these segments with Karen Jarrett and, and Bruce. And with it being 2017, is it safe to say? that we're past the point of a of the bad guy boss or the heel authority figure storyline in, in professional wrestling? Absolutely. That is so, so played out. 
like it seems like that's where they're going for but it's like i i don't know <laughs> i don't really care about it is that i don't know i know that's harsh but i just want to watch the wrestling i don't care you know unless it's really going to play a pivotal role i i don't think the heel authority figure storyline needs to happen right now i don't either and i was a big supporter of a long time for a long time for them to have you know a matchmaker so to speak so do you watch lucha underground at all um i do from time to time it's it's you know there's so much wrestling to watch but yeah. I, I do try to watch it when i can so i'm a little behind i haven't watched this season i'm so I'm, I'm i'm behind but i know they had katrina where she was she was like the matchmaker mm-hmm. and and i guess uh ring of honor had it too with nigel mcginnis where he was just more of a i'm not gonna play this authority figure type of thing and try to screw all the wrestlers over i'm just gonna kind of hey this is the match that's gonna happen and I think that role was missing on Impact all of last year. Someone to just kind of come out and make the match. You know, Dixie did it every once in a while. Corgan did it every once in a while. But it almost seemed like the, what do you call it? The, um, the, focus. the inmates were running. No, it seemed like the inmates were running the asylum. Like the wrestlers were making the matches. Oh, yeah. So last year, that's how it was coming off. So I do think they need someone in that role to say, hey, this is what's going on. But I think Dutch fills that role very well. I mean, he's had a couple backstage interviews where he's like, next week we're going to have this. You know, it's not this dramatic, I'm going to come down to the ring and try to get a reaction. I think mm-hmm. it's just, so I think they're, I think they need some kind of authority figure. But yeah, as you were saying, this heel authority figure is so, is so done. And we've never had a reason to care for Bruce. And I actually turned on Bruce's podcast I've been listening to a lot this last week, actually, and it's mm-hmm. actually pretty good. I heard it's really good. I, I've heard, you know, I listened to the one, it's either he was on Austin's podcast or Austin was on his, and it was really entertaining. But, I mean, from aside from that, I don't feel the need, other than Dutch, I don't feel the need for any kind of focus to be on any other non-wrestler, whether it's Jeff Jarrett, Karen Jarrett, or... Or Bruce Pritchard. You have, like you said, you have the one matchmaker. He doesn't come out and take up a lot of TV time. If anything, you know, they do it in the, uh, you know, the, the little YouTube segments. And it gives you a reason to go watch YouTube. Oh, find out what match uh, Dutch made for next week, you know? Right, and that's what they're doing with Destination X with the knockouts. Because mm-hmm. Karen did a video saying, I'm going to announce something really big for the knockouts for Destination X. So I hope we're getting a Ultimate X match with the knockouts. That might be very far-fetched but i think it would be huge on a live show well i mean we got the uh the we got locks not last knockout standing matches we've gotten cage matches i mean it's really the the next step you know right they gotta unless they're gonna try to do a queen of the mountain match or something like that but they need to we've we've gotten a th- i think three last knockout standing matches this year i think mm-hmm. we've only got one cage match but we need the next step, especially with other companies taking the next step. So I hope they, I hope they do take that, that yeah, next I, step with this, but, but coming, going back to this match, the grand championship match, I was saying on Twitter, they need to, whoever's agenting these matches, they need to lay these matches out better because this is, this is a few matches in a row now. And I actually think it's hurting Moose as a character a little bit with the fans because he had the Grand Championship match with Eli Drake. Eli Drake obviously won this match. If you're watching from home, they mm-hmm. gave the decision to Moose. But if you're watching as a fan from home, Eli Drake almost dominated the match. So it was complete crap. This one, EC3 wins the first round. EC3 should have won the second round. He, yeah. he dominated most of that round. He, he had the offense for about two of those three minutes. Yeah, and uh, you know that's I mean that that's go back goes back to it just you know being, that it being wrestling so we get we got to make it go to the third third fall you know yeah and when they first announced the grand championship match I was saying on the podcast that there was a lot of different ways they could go with these matches there was actually a lot of different finishes that they could come up with and they haven't gotten creative with the finishes outside of Galloway and Moose where Galloway was using the low blow you know, taking advantage of the fact that it was no disqualification and taking the judges, um, the, the dock on the points from the judges. That's the only creativity we've 
really seen this entire time. Mm-hmm. There's there you you could have had matches where the baby face is getting dominated and they the last round try to make this big ultimate comeback but ultimately fail or someone who does make that big comeback but the matches have all been laid out very similar they always split the first two rounds the only one that's been dominant was moose beating uh marche rocket which actually i think pissed most people off because they wanted to see something competitive there mm-hmm I remember Aaron Rex had a match with Baron Dax where Baron Dax won the first couple rounds. Actually, when Aaron Rex was the champion, he lost most of the rounds. He just always won by pinfall. But but in, in that in that title run, he always lost the rounds. With the Moose title run, he's always splitting the rounds. Mm-hmm. And um, the third round of this was actually excellent. There was a lot of good wrestling in this. Yeah, did you see... I, it's the, I forget what round it was, but uh, they, they did the... Uh, the super clothesline spot where Moose was supposed to do a, like a, a backflip, but he landed right on his neck. It was nasty. Oh yeah, it scared the crap out of me. That scared me too. But that shows. I think that goes to show what what Moose is willing to sacrifice in the ring for him to even try to pull that off. But it did. It did look pretty cool. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, you you do you want to talk about the finish? Yes. Okay, so. I mean, this kind of kind of circles back to the whole Bruce Pritchard thing, where they, you know, he awards the, uh, you know, the third fall to EC3, and they, they, the announcers, you know, to their credit, they uh, went out of their way to be like, oh, well, that's, you know, that's really surprising, and I think even Dutch did a did a post match or a post show interview, um, kind of questioning it. Can you see if we're gonna do anything with Bruce Pritchard? Can you see? This tying into EC3's title, I could see this being a long title run for EC3, where he has Bruce in his back pocket as like a crooked judge, you know. And the whole thing is that EC3 is like, all I need to do to retain this title is make it through three rounds, and I'm golden. So the whole thing is, we need to find a guy who's going to beat him before uh, the three rounds are are finished. Right, because EC3's character is for the most part unbeatable. He's very mm-hmm. difficult to pin. Very difficult to submit so i i could see that going actually um make a pretty good point with that that maybe that it maybe it is okay bruce is gonna, gonna be in his back pocket because they used to have the three random judges and now all of a sudden they have scott namore dutch and and bruce mm-hmm. i thought the end was a little bit flat in the way that they said you know these two judges score at a tie and then all of a sudden bruce has this lopsided i mean it wasn't like Moose dominated the round. It was a very 50-50 round. So if just because Bruce gave it 10-8, the hell cares? You know, I, I didn't see that as some, oh, my God, what what is Bruce doing? Mm-hmm. So I don't think it quite came off the way they wanted it to, only because the Grand Impact matches, for the most part, lack, lack much drama. But I don't think that whatever, when Billy Corgan designed this title, I think he meant for it to be a wrestling title. You know, for guys like Eddie to hold it, for Davy to hold it, Galloway to hold it. At the mm-hmm. time, I think he was supposed to be the first title holder, in my opinion. And it's become, you know, a lot of heavyweight wrestling. The matches haven't been laid out with a special sense of purpose like we would think they should be, since they have the rounds to work within. Mm-hmm. So, we'll see. You know, I, I, this is going to be really interesting, EC3 holding this title. Yeah, no, I I think it's gonna be it's gonna be your classic heel champion getting out by the skin of his teeth, uh, you know, crooked crooked judge in his back pocket because you see three is the guy with the money, and uh, yeah, I mean, y- and you're gonna want to find that guy that just kicks his ass and then knocks him out, you know, and that's right. the, that's the that's the, end, that's the end result, that's the payoff. Now before we had this match, we had um, would appear to be Eli Drake versus Eddie Edwards. And I think this was a match people actually would have liked to see. This is the second time now that Eli Drake has participated in a match like this where he came down and the match didn't happen. I was going to say, what do, you, what do you think they're doing with him? I think he's in a weird place right now where he's just the guy that fits that role of like, he just, he just, he just, I don't, I don't even know what role that is, but he just slides into an area of, you know, like that, that, uh, that Dolph Ziggler, like this is the guy that's going to put everyone over because he can put on a good match type of thing. I think he falls into that role for GFW and it's really unfortunate. 
Mm -hmm. He's that guy that it's like, he's just that middle guy. He's just stuck right in the middle. Okay. We need someone to just stand in the ring and not have a match. We need someone to go out there and lose. He, he just, it really sucks. You know, especially he should have some kind of momentum after winning that four way match. And he has none whatsoever, but this is the second time they've done it to him. When I was at the, the uh, very first taping with Anthem, um, when they, the night that debuted, uh, when Bruce came out in Dutch and all that, and the episode wasn't very good, he did the same thing. He came out for a match with Moose, and Cody came out and attacked Moose, and then the match didn't happen. Now, in the Impact Zone, it was funny because it wasn't on TV, but the crowd started chanting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and night 10, like, and, and you know, and basically saying that Eli Drake won via forfeit. So it was, it was actually kind of a funny thing that happened in the arena there, but... This was very strange because this was Congo Kong attacking Eddie Edwards and, and basically acting very jealous backstage, maybe, with Laurel. He attacked that Richard Justice guy, the standby wrestler. Very, yeah, like, weird, very, what's that? I like the guy, uh, Dick Justice. He's a, he's a, he's a good dude. Um, I, I, I like to see him and Grado team up. That's just, that's just my personal opinion. Isn't he married to Missy Hyatt? Uh, supposedly, <laughs> um, the, the, the quote unquote wedding was, was done right here in Cleveland, uh, at our, our local indie show. So, uh, unless he did it somewhere else, but, uh, it, he's a, he's a good dude. He's, he's a, he's a funny guy. And I hadn't, that was a pleasant surprise to see him, uh, on impact. Yeah. It's going to be weird to see if he ever has a match or what happens exactly. But the whole mm-hmm. Congo Kong thing, I thought, I thought was really random. Because, yeah. I mean, I, I guess he's just being jealous. I don't... Because they never really explain what the situation is between him and Laurel, what the relationship is. Yeah, I always just figured it was all like a... Almost like a bodyguard type thing. I never looked at it as like a... As a romantic thing. Yeah. I'd... So, random match of the night. We get Suicide, Grado, and Braxton Sutter versus KM, Mario Bokora, and Falaba. This was, this was a filler match. This was random you know it was only th- three and a half minutes so i had said on twitter i hope that this match actually gets some time but i was pretty sure it was just gonna be a three or four minute match done to advance the grado storyline and that's exactly what this was oh yeah yeah they've been doing this a lot lately giving us a bullshit match for the sake of advancing a storyline G- grado has not won a match on impact and in, in forever I think since he beat Eli Drake a couple times, because why wouldn't he beat Eli Drake of all people? So, so the match was a was for the most part kind of a train wreck. Now I'm a major Braxton Sutter fan. I enjoy watching the Suicide character. I enjoy KM. I have some interest in what Mario Boca and Falaba can really do. They made these guys. They haven't given these guys a chance since they come in the company. They've they've come into job. At this point, I think I could take Falaba off his off his feet. <laughs> right? And you think of the guy that big, I mean, that should be his whole gimmick, is like no one can move this dude. Right, but he's been a you know, comedy character and he's taken off his feet two or three times per match. Mm-hmm. You know, the whole thing of him following out falling out of the ring is has been done to death. I really want to see what these guys can do. And when I, when I do my uh, Impact Live report with Kyle later, I really want him. Mario Bocaron Falaba had a match with LAX. And I know at a live event, people get a little more time. So I'm curious to see what these guys can actually do. But the match was super random. It was done to get Grado a win. He made Cam look ridiculous by doing the whole tripping routine where mm-hmm. he didn't even get in, at a good position. So Cam had to like stumble back an extra three or four feet to fall backwards. It was, yeah, uh, this, this this was a train wreck. <laughs> yeah, I mean it was definitely a vehicle to uh, to advance that storyline, um, and we also got the whole uh, the tension between Braxton and Allie too, which I think it, I think that the uh, the story between Braxton and Allie, and the whole thing with Grado and uh, Congo Kong and uh, and um, uh, geez, who am I thinking of? Laurel are going to kind of intertwine. I think so. I can't imagine, and I haven't talked about this at all on the podcast, actually. I just keep 
overlooking it, but the whole Braxton and Allie thing, I can't imagine they're splitting them up this quickly, especially with a real life married couple. Yeah. Well, here's what I, this is like, I guess it's just like my, my fantasy booking. Um, and I think I kind of got this from, I think it was last week's episode. Either you said it or, uh, one of your guests you had on, um, was eventually Laurel agreeing to do the wedding with Grado, but then doing the flip side and leaving him at the altar. Right. Right. To the point where maybe like the, the following week on uh, on Impact, you know, Grado's all like down the dumps and Allie comes over to kind of console him. Braxton flips out. So you kind of see like this whole Grado loves Allie storyline. Right. And then maybe you get some you kind of flip it around where Braxton's with Laurel and Laurel can finally get get rid of the whole uh, dirty wedding dress situation. Yeah, I think there's some moving parts with this that we don't. They do a good job of keeping us guessing. You know, mm-hmm. it, it, sometimes it comes across as unorganized, but it's really, it's really because we're so used to watching on maybe on another wrestling show things being so obvious mm-hmm. that it comes across with this like it's just unorganized. But I'm curious to see where it goes. I, if I had a fantasy book, this I I I would like to see this go the the '80s Macho Man angle where Braxton maybe is kind of a heel and Allie's just the the baby face valet and it doesn't yeah. necessarily live to lead, lead to like some kind of split or him, her turning on him or anything like that. But it's just an interesting dynamic that we haven't had in a while. Yeah. And you can do that. I mean, even if you, if you intertwine it with the Grado thing, Grado plays the role of uh George, the animal steel, and then Braxton kicks the crap out of him. We're just going to see. I, I haven't, I don't think anyone knows, knows where they're going with it, but I think you bring up some good ideas and I think it's, I think it is all, intertwining we just don't know what the hell is going on yet but uh hopefully this next episode which i think is the last one of the tapings or it's the second to last one hopefully we start getting some answers i've just been upset that this wedding thing keeps getting dr- drug out like i want laura to just say yes i'm gonna marry you like it just keeps getting pushed off pushed off and i'm ready to see what's going on here <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm, yeah I'm the, a little impatient there has to be uh, like an end result from everything just going all the way back from you know the the braxton and laurel wedding it has to lead to something you know lax is interviewed backstage with Mackenzie mitchell and quote of the night conan calls her random white girl number five <laughs> love it <laughs> freaking great that is money right there it's it's crazy how much they push the racial line a little bit with the with LAX but I think it's necessary in order to really build them as you know the way they're trying to build them of a very no nonsense don't give an f type of stable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like them. I I love LAX. I mean that they're one of the you know most interesting things going on on the entire uh in the entire company really. Right and so the main event was and that they've been They've been laying their hat on this LAX versus El Patron thing for several weeks now. So the main event is LAX versus Alberto El Patron, El Hijo de Dos Caras, and Dos Caras himself. LAX has looked very weak weak the last several weeks. They lost to Lashley and El Patron clean. The following week, El Patron takes them out single-handedly. Last week, he pretty much still took them single out single-handedly in a gauntlet match. I was thinking there's no way. They're not going to DCC these guys. There's no way LAX is losing this match. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I was actually impressed. What did you think about his father, Dos Caras, in the ring earlier? He started the match, oddly enough. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. Um, I think it's to the point where you think of, like, these, you know, the older wrestlers as, you know, you're going to get, like, a Bruno San Martino coming in there. No offense to Bruno. I love Bruno kind of just kind of hobbling around and not really doing anything and not kind of the the other talent going the extra mile to quote unquote carry uh the older talent but i that was not the case here no it wasn't i wasn't sure that his father could work because at slam anniversary when he was like moving around the ring after king mo like he looked like he could barely barely move mm-hmm. so i would say i was actually surprised that he had some uh Still got it a little bit. He had, he had some moves in him still. Make make a make a uh, a good good lucha lucha thing. 
El Hijo, the Dos Caras, got tagged in. And his brother got some moves. He, he's a bigger guy, but he's kind of got that luchador style. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw a picture on Facebook of him in the ring with like a jacket on, like a long, long coat on like James Storm has. Okay. Which kind of tells me he's probably got another match here in the future. I don't know if he's how much he's going to be wrestling on the program. I would imagine he's just around for this because I don't see what they could do with him long term. But it's it's kind of nice. Uh, I, I kind of like the family dynamic of the two masked guys and and Alberto, you know, being so different. It was that whole Cody Goldust dynamic, which is kind of cool. Um, yeah, and in that situation, it's a good thing on the writers uh, the writer's behalf because you're gonna cheer for for uh, Patron and and his family, you know, when they're going against the big bad LAX dudes. Right, exactly. And, and this time, you know, this time we got Homicide, you know, I was concerned last week that maybe he wasn't cleared to wrestle because he jobbed so quickly, but he actually got in here this time and, and did some work. So I was actually pretty entertained with the match. And what did you think about the finish with, with, uh, I, I really wanted Kingston to be part of this group. I think mainly because I, right. I just want some kind of confirmation that Kingston isn't being released. So, yeah, and it, that that's another thing too. Um, first of all, um, I don't read spoilers, so this was um, you know what I, the only thing I did is like I said I had to do some catch up, so I watched the the YouTube clips. You know, um, I I got to be honest, I didn't like it. You know, um, I have no no you know issue with low key at all. Um, I the thing I did I think was cool was he did have the LAX in the back of his suit jacket so that was that was kind of kind of funny and kind of cool but um, to your point yeah I think Kingston would have been a way better choice um, I did like the Warriors way like completely unsuspected uh, onto Patron there but um, I don't know I just I don't I think low key is his own dude I don't think he should be because I think he's just gonna get lost in the shuffle. Uh, in LAX, unless they let him, like you say, stay in the in the uh, X division and represent LAX, but it seems like they're putting him directly into a feud with uh, El Patron. Right. From what I've heard, I don't know if someone was just speculating, but I've heard he's got a match with El Patron at Destination X, so that could be really interesting because he may end up with the global title because we suspect that he's going to drop the title at this show. We don't know that for sure. I don't know that Loki fits what they're doing. And the reason I say that, as cool as it is, and he's Puerto Rican, and he, he fits you know the group of Puerto Rican dudes, I don't see him sitting around in the clubhouse BS. You know, when they do the clubhouse segments, I don't yes. see him in that setting. Yeah, you know, if anything, he'll be, like, off by himself. He'll be like, hey, you know, he'll, be, he'll look like a stick in the mud there. And that's... And that's his character, you know. That's he's he's just he's his own dude. I, I just I don't get it. I don't I don't I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, with the hitman gimmick. I mean, I think I wouldn't say I don't like it. I'm very intrigued by it. I just my gut tells me it's not a long term thing. You can't yeah. make that group that big. I mean, you can't do this NWO thing with it, where it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. That's what I was thinking they were doing because they. I mean, you've heard the rumors of the uh, uh, the Rey Mysterio signing. So I mean, you would think that. With his history with Conan, they're gonna have something to do if if he does sign, you know. Yeah. There's that de- they're definitely pushing the Latin market. I don't mm-hmm. believe that Impact is on TV in Mexico, and I think that's where, I think right now behind the scenes, I think that's the the next goal for them. Because Impact is, I mean, wrestling is popular there, and as as great as you know having three million viewers in India is, and I don't want to. I don't know if, how many people from India have listened to the show, and I don't want to downplay or, or hurt anyone or disrespect anyone. But the reason there's so many, um, you know, like WWE's pushing this big India thing because they said, oh, we found out, you know, half our social media followers are from India and stuff like that. There, there's a reason for this. And I, I know from experience, India is a very cheap country to advertise in. And I know because I've advertised in India, it's a fraction. Um, I, I, I would say it's about uh, 30 to 40 times cheaper 
to advertise in India than is the United States. Um, so say social media numbers and you're running, you're running ads to India. Uh, or let me even break this down a little bit more. If you've, if you're running an ad, like you've seen on Facebook, you log on and you know, there's, Hey, would you like to like this page? Cause there's an ad saying, Oh, here's a wrestling page and you hit, you can choose to hit like or not running those ads. A like in the United States costs you about 65 cents per like in India. It costs about, I mean, if you're running an ad in India, it costs about two cents per like as great as it is to have a market over there. The people who live there aren't necessarily like consumers of wrestling. Like the impact gets a nice $6 million check every year from Sony six. But when you're talking like merchandise and stuff like that, people in India are not necessarily making purchases because it's not a wealthy country. Mm-hmm. Um, and Mexico is not really a wealthy country either, but the difference with people in Mexico being as big wrestling fans as they are, they're the type that's like, if I've got, if I've got 15 minutes, if I have to put aside $15 to go to this wrestling event, I'm going to do it because they're very passionate about those kind of things. If they're passionate about their sports or whatever it is, they are going to go support the shit out of it. They're not going to use that excuse here in the United States. Like, oh, we don't got the, we don't got the money. We can't go. So I think it's a better market to focus on. I think it's a big market to focus on right now. And I think that's where, I think that's the goal. I know I'm probably rambling a little bit, but I think the goal is they want to get on TV in Mexico. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, especially, you know, they, they've got the partnership with AAA. And so, I mean, that's, that's already a foot in the door right there. Right. I mean, why you got the partnership with two, with two companies out there, you know, and I've seen people online say, well, why did, well, who cares about a partnership if they're not in Japan, if they're not in Mexico? Well, pretty sure Jeff is working towards that. <laughs> let's let's be mm-hmm. real here. Yeah. I mean, that's really what, I mean, if you think about it, that was the whole concept of GFW from the inception, you know? But uh, Loki gets the win here. Not Loki. Loki gets, helps LA get the win. And El Patron actually takes the pin in this. They easily could have. Uh, his brother or his dad could have taken the pin in this easily, but El Patron took one and we needed him to take one because he's been looking like Superman lately. And as much mm-hmm. as I hate champions going over in a non-title way, he needed to take the pin in this one. Would, would, do you think so? Yeah. I mean, of course, because it's going to be that that's your main target. So if you could show that he is in any way vulnerable, then that makes LAX any member of LAX uh, look like it's threats of the world champion. So overall, as I said, I wasn't as entertained with this episode as I was a couple of the previous ones. I don't know why. I think it was the crowd. I really do. And I'm not blaming the crowd if there was a storm and I, I get that, but that doesn't change the fact that it was dead in there. And I think it took me out of it from home. Um, the only thing they really appeared to react to was the main event for, for whatever reason, El Patron gets a reaction Grado gets a reaction. Ali gets a reaction. So there's, there's people who always get a reaction when they come out there. Even EC3 got a little bit of one when he came out earlier, started smooching the belt. Yeah, what was that all about? I mean, I thought that was hilarious, but I'm like, ooh, well, like, what is he coming out here for? That's good. EC, he has to tap that like inner douchebag stuff again. <laughs> yes. You know. So that is, uh, that's it for the show. I don't know what they've got planned for next week. I don't know if they've announced any matches or not. It seems like they've been so focused on Destination X. Yeah, I mean, are we getting the um, are we getting the uh, Ishimori match next week? That's right. So we're getting Ishimori and ACH. Yeah. So that is the last match for that set of tapings because then at Destination X we get the finals. Yeah. So. so. It's gonna be. I think it's just gonna be your classic go home. We're gonna find out uh, if uh, El Patron has a has a challenger, and you know, I think it's gonna be very heavily. You know, I think. They're going to focus on what they've been focusing on. It's going to be focused on the EC3 thing. It's going to be focused on Grado, especially with the whole deportation thing. And then um, and then I think that it's going to be heavily, heavily focused on this whole LAX thing. Oh, heavily. This there's <laughs> this shit's all about LAX and El Patron right now. So. Mm-hmm. But um, I think that's going to do it for us today. Another episode of the King of the Mountain podcast in the can. As I said, please hit subscribe if you haven't already. And 
I will be re- reviewing the Impact Live events coming up here soon, and I've got the interview with Sienna coming as well. So definitely subscribe, and we will talk to you guys later. Peace.